Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you very much. We bless your name because you brought us together for a good thing as we study together tonight. We know that the study of your word is what gives us backbone in our personal Christian lives as well as in our families. We're asking that your spirit will be present with us and you help everyone to get the very best out of your word tonight in Jesus' name. We pray that virtually everyone present here today, workers, leaders, members, visitors, everyone will get the best out of the study of the word in Jesus' name. And we pray that the present problems in whatever family may be represented here, you grant us the grace to be attentive so you can solve the problems for us, O Lord, in Jesus' name. We pray that you grant us understanding. We pray that your spirit will make personal application to every life. In Jesus' name we pray. At present, we have a series, and it's on marriage and the family. For the benefit of those who might be coming for the first time, we'll be looking at 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through to 7. And we've been staying long on this passage because we want to make use of the passage to bring solutions to the problems that may be experienced in our families. Our study today is from 1 Peter chapter 3, from verse 4 to verse 6. From verse 1, the apostle, by the inspiration of the Spirit, has been speaking to the wives, believing wives, Christian wives. And as he comes to verse 4, he's telling the Christian wife that the Christian wife should have a spiritual ornament, a spiritual adornment, so that there will be that meek and quiet spirit, which in the presence of God is of great price. Look at it in verse 4, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. In our study today, we're looking at the family and we're looking at the divine plan and the divine pattern for the Christian family. Obviously, God, who instituted the family and the marriage, he has given us blueprints for a happy union between a Christian man and his believing wife. If you really want to have a happy family, a satisfactory, satisfying, fulfilled marriage. The best attitude you will have is to go back to God and let him give you the principles and the pattern so that you will be able to have the blueprint of the Lord because he himself created, instituted marriage and the family and he knows what is best for a particular family. And then as Peter makes allusion to what the women ought to do, Christian women, Christian wives, he now gives us a particular example. He's saying that what he was saying was not anything peculiar, anything isolated, anything unique. It's applicable to all Christian families. And you as a Christian wife should not think that this is difficult. This is uh, unreachable, unattainable. I cannot do this. No, he tells you in verse 5, for after this manner, in all time, holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection to their own husbands. The point is, if the grace of God and the strength of God and the power of God and the love of God was available to those other women that followed the way of righteousness and holiness, God has not changed. The grace has not changed. The characteristics of believing women and believing men have not changed. That same God that helped them can help you and he will help you. And he brings a particular example of a family in verse 6. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. It's very interesting that Peter has brought out the example of Abraham and Sarah. And yet Peter is following what had been revealed in the Old Testament because, you know, God showed Abraham and Sarah as an example for the whole of the children of Israel. Look at Isaiah chapter 51. Isaiah 51, reading from verses 1 and 2. Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock from whence ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence ye are digged. He's talking to the people that follow after righteousness. And the people that are seeking after the Lord. The people who have been taken out of the world because it says, look at the fact that you have been digged out of the hole. It's pulled you out. You are the called out people. You are the special people of the Lord. And now in verse 2, he gives them the example they ought to follow. 
in verse 2, look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bear you, for I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. Just like the Lord himself used Isaiah to call upon the children of Israel, look at Abraham, look at Sarah, I called them alone, and they followed my pathway, and I blessed them, and I increased them, and it was telling every family in Israel, do the same thing. Come out of the world. Come out of idolatry. And follow the pathway of righteousness that your father Abraham and your mother Sarah walked in. And as I bless them, I'm going to bless you. That unique couple married as some believers as Abraham and Sarai. They were in idolatry. But the Lord called Abraham and Sarah followed as well. And they became believing man and believing woman. Abraham became known as a friend of God. And now Peter is telling us that Sarah became one of the holy women in the olden days. And after the transformation that took place in their lives, they became a unique shining example to other families. But please remember, Abraham became Abraham. Sarai became Sarah. And then when that divine touch had taken place, the Lord could not do whatever he wanted to do in their family. If you will allow the Lord to have a divine touch in your life, transformation in your life, and he plants his truth in your life, and the husband is touched, and the wife is transformed, and you have the believing man and the believing woman, there is no limit to what God can do in your family. We're broadening the study tonight uh, beyond just the verses I've read to you. We're looking at three points. Number one, divine purpose for the family. Number two, destructive problems in the family. Number three, desirable pattern for the family. It's very good for those who are married and for those who are here to get married to know the divine purpose for the family. As somebody says that if you are going on a journey and you forget your destination and the purpose for even taking the journey itself, then you'll be wasting your time, wasting the fuel, and wasting your resources. There are many people that have gotten married and they have forgotten the purpose of marriage. And the man and the woman, they are living together like tenants under the same roof. They are called by the name Christian, by the name believer. But the divine pattern, the divine purpose, the divine plan for marriage, they have lost sight of, they are forgotten. And because of that, as they are living together, the purpose of God and the reason for the marriage cannot be fulfilled. Maybe you knew this before, but you check it off with your family now. And maybe you are in courtship now and you are thinking in a few we in a few weeks time, months time, you'll be getting married. Look at all these things and look at the purpose for marriage. Or maybe you are praying and you are saying, Lord, I want your will in my life. I want you to reveal to me the person I ought to get married to. As you are praying, you need to look at the purpose for marriage. So that when you come out to say, this is the will of God for my life in marriage, you'll be able to check up, will this individual fulfill the plan and the purpose for me in the marriage? Let, let's look at them one by one. Already you have it on your outline. Number one, there is partnership. Number two, there is procreation. Number three, there is protection. Number three, number four, there is purity. Number five, pure pleasure. Not just pleasure, pure pleasure. And then number six, there is provision. Number five, preservation of posterity. Number eight, there is power. And let's look at them one by one. I'm praying that the Spirit of God himself will interpret all these things in your heart and apply it to your family because we don't have the time to expatiate, elaborate on everything. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. The Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me suitable fit for him. That's partnership. If you are not married yet and you are planning to get married, the person I'm pointing to that this is the will of God for me, can we be partners? You want to find out as you pray. Are we, can we really be partners? I'm educated, I'm, you know, on the ivory tower of education. She has never gone to school. And our language, we cannot understand one another. I talk with sense. I talk with knowledge. I talk with intelligence. Everything is Greek and Hebrew to her. She doesn't understand. Can she really be my partner? 
here you are, you are a woman, and you say, this is the will of God. But you see this man, he is a family man. His mother will be there with him. And all the relatives are there. And he cannot do without his mother. All the people in the village, they are always living with him. He has not grown up to be a man. And you are an independent woman, and you know how to live your life. Here you are, you don't care about all those things. She cares about all those things. Can you really be partners? Can two work together except they be agreed? If you are married already, are you partners together? Are you sharing together? Are you sharing your mind? Are you sharing your property? Are you sharing the room? Are you sharing your interests? Are you sharing your desires? Are you sharing that same business together? One of the purposes of marriage is partnership. Number two is procreation. In Genesis chapter 1. Reading from verse 27, so God created man in his image. In the image of God created him, male and female created he them. God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. Here we find another reason for marriage. God gave that himself. That was a plan and the purpose of God. That when they come together, they will be able to have children. Here is where we have to face reality and face fact. My brother, if you happen to be a eunuch and you cannot, uh, your body is not biologically complete and you say you are praying for the will of God and you do not come out to say really you are a eunuch and you cannot produce children and, and you do not tell that lady that says yes, it is the will of God for me. Are we actually factual? Are we going to be able to fulfill the purpose of marriage? Or you woman, you know that, excuse my language, because I have to be very clear so everybody can understand. You've never had period in your life. The regular monthly period has never really happened. And then the parts of your body that ought to develop to help the marriage has not developed. Or maybe there was a problem and uh, they performed operation on you and they removed uh, everything. After they have done that and you are closing your eyes, you are praying for marriage. One of the purposes of marriage is procreation. Think about it. If that miracle has not taken place and the body is not complete, to be able to have children, are we really sure we are praying aright? Another reason for marriage is protection. I read of a, a brother, a man and a woman, and they were in courtship together. And they, they, they went for a walk in the woods. But the mistake is they didn't know there was a sheep bear that uh, was around there. And then they passed through between the sheep bear and the children and the cubs. And then the, the, the sheep bear got hold of the woman. That's the fiancé. And wanted to tear that woman in pieces. And then the man that was to marry this woman jumped uh, in the case and then tore the bear away from the wife-to-be. And then the bear now got hold of uh, him and broke some bones in his body. Well, eventually to court, a long story short, they had to take that man to the hospital and they performed the operations and the man got well and they got married. You tell me the commitment and the faithfulness of that woman to the man because it was a man that protected her life. Now, if they can do that, and the story I'm telling you, those people are still alive. We who say we are Christians, you should be able to protect your wife if you are married. With everything you've got, your intelligence, your money, your ability, everything you have, protect her from the in-law. Protect her from everybody because one of the purposes of marriage is protection. In First, in first Corinthians chapter 7 verse 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. Let every man have her own, uh, her own husband. You will see monogamy there. One man, one wife. Let every man have his own wife in the singular. And every woman, her own husband in the singular. And then it says to avoid fornication, get married. One of the reasons, therefore, is purity. And that connects with the pure pleasure. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, reading there from verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 5, reading from verse 8. But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own household, is, uh, is, he has denied the faith, he is worse than an infidel. And that means then, as we talk about marriage, you are a man. You must make sure that you are making provision already. And you say you've known the will of God. You've got accommodation yet? Do you have the money you are going to pay for the dowry? 
and do, have you equipped the kitchen? Everything that they are going to, that the woman is going to use. If you cannot make that basic, essential, um, rudimentary kind of preparation and provision, how are you going to take care of her when she comes in? And then those of us who have gotten married, are we making provision for the woman? Or we are telling the woman, you go and walk too. We thank God for the Christian wives that are walking. But actually the provision of the family is on the shoulder, on the head of the man. And if you are planning to get children, it is not just, I want a child, I want children, I want children. When the children come, have you made provision? All that the children will use, have you made provision? And as the children are growing up, are you making provision for their education? It's very important to understand that one of the reasons and purposes of marriage is that there will be provision for every member of that unit family. In Malachi, Malachi chapter 2, reading there from verse 14 to verse 16, it's telling us the reason why we get married, why God himself instituted marriage, is that there will be a preservation of a godly posterity. Yet ye say, wherefore, because the Lord has been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet she is thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did he not make one yet he is the residue of the spirit? Yes, I did the residue of the spirit. And wherefore, one, that he might seek a godly seed. We therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hated putting away, he hates divorce. For one covereth violence with his garment, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit, that you deal not treacherously. We now go to point number two. Destructive problems in the family. And you will see in the Malachi passage that we read that God himself said that they were dealing treacherously with one another. Unfaithful with one another. But the question is, if God made everything good, and when he made the creation, he finalized everything, he looked at everything he had made, and he said it was very good. How is it then that there, was, there, is, there are problems now and pain in families? If you look at Ecclesiastes, chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, the last verse there, that's verse 29. Lo, this only have I found, that God has made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. That is, the creation of the Lord was perfect, it was good, it was upright, but then there was a fall, and after the fall, great, painful, terrible consequences came upon the human race. And it is the fall of man that brings depravity to every heart and every life. And then when there's depravity in the man, depravity in the woman, and both of them come together as husband and wife, the double depravity, walking together, interacting together, colliding together, we create conflict and problems in the family. But if we are born again, and then we are sanctified, that depravity should be dealt with. But sometimes in our families, we forget ourselves. You know, it's even unfortunate that uh, Abraham, that is given to us as an example. Uh, there was a time when problem came in his own family. A disagreement came in the family. And the disagreement came because they stepped away from walking by faith, and walking in love, and walking in the trust of God. The Lord had given them promise that he'll give them children. And God had not forgotten his promise. But momentarily for a time, they departed from the path of faith. When we depart from the path of faith, and unbelief comes in, advice of relatives comes in, looking at what other families around us are doing, all that will come in. Impatience, I must have it now, we must have the children now, impatience comes in. And endurance has gone out, and then we are now impatient. I cannot endure this. I didn't know this the way it will be. And we depart from the path of faith, and the path of love, and the path of hope. Problems will come in. In Genesis chapter 21 verse 10. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bond woman and her son. For the son of this bond woman shall not be heir with my son, even with I see. 
actually Sarah respected and honored Abraham. She submitted to Abraham to the point she'll be calling him Lord. But now a problem had come in. And as a result of the problem, you see that submission is forgotten. And you will also see that the respectful language, communication, is forgotten. And you will see the kind of language now, and the kind of command, and the kind of authoritative attitude she was having towards Abraham. And that was straight to Abraham. In verse 11, and the thing was grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. Of course, it became something that was surprising to Abraham that you are talking to me like that. You have not been doing like that. Is it because of this? When you depart from the paths of faith and the paths of love, and you depart from the principles of righteousness that the Lord has given, many, many things will happen, many things will come into the family. But thank God he solved the problem for them. But we're still looking at the fact that there are destructive problems that can arise and come into the family. In 2 Samuel chapter 6. I'm reading now from verse 20 to verse 23. And David returned to bless his household. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants, as one of the vain fellows shamefully uncovered himself. I told you already that when there are differences of understanding, differences of spirituality, there, there can be problems in the family. Do you know the background of David? The sweet psalmist of Israel. The singer in Israel. The one anointed with the Holy Ghost. Do you know the background of David? The one that trusted in the Lord. And the things of the Lord were very precious to him. Do you know the background of Michael? Michael? In the, uh, because a Saul was a father of Michael. We don't read of any family devotion in the family of Saul. The reading and the interpretation of the scriptures in the family of Saul. Only that he, she had, he had a physical beauty. And he was very lanky and very tall. And was very strong. Head and shoulders above all the rest in Israel. Physical qualities were seen Saul. And eventually when he was chosen king, even the little spiritual thing that came upon him, he soon lost everything. And that's where this Michael is coming from. That's the background of Michael. And David got married unto her. The ark of the Lord had been far away for a long time. And David had been eager that the ark of the covenant of the Lord will come back to the house of Israel. And when the opportunity came to bring the ark of the covenant, what joy came into his heart. He forgot himself. We've come together, so forget yourself and worship the Lord. And he forgot himself and just abandoned himself into the service, into the worship of the Lord. And she danced before the Lord. The joy of God, the joy of the Lord was in his heart. And Michael looked out and saw him. Instead of worshiping the Lord with him, she despised him. She ridiculed him. She even abused him. She even called him a bad name. Vain fellow. Shamefully uh, behaving and covering yourself before the people. In verse 21, And David said unto Michael, It was before the Lord, which chose me before thy father, and before all his house, to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord. And I will yet be more vile. You say I'm vile. You say I'm, uh, I'm a person to be ridiculed. I want more ridicule. Because I've done that before the Lord. And will be based in my own sight. And of the hand and of the maid servants. We thou was spoken of. Of them shall I be adding honor. But the problem did not stop there. God in heaven was watching there. And he knew the importance of the Ark of the Covenant. It was a representation of the presence of the Lord in the nation. And it was a commendable thing that David will run after that ark, will pursue that ark, and bring that ark back to the land of Israel. And God did not appreciate it that this woman, the wife of David, will despise the husband for bringing in the ark of the covenant. Despising David for such a thing was not just despising David, it was despising God, represented by the ark of the covenant. Verse, verse 23, there. For because of that, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child until the day of her death. You don't understand that? 
Yes, you don't understand. Who knows? See if uh, she had been cooperative with uh, David and had worshipped the Lord with David, accepted the God of Israel like David, rejoiced before the Lord like David, abandoned herself into the service of God, the worship of God like David. She would have had children. Who knows? One of her sons might be the king of Israel to take over from David. But she despised the Lord. She despised the king of Israel. She despised the ark of the covenant of God. And as chastisement and punishment upon her, the family problem is she had no child till the day of her death. And this is the reason why some problems come into the families. In, in the New Testament, in Colossians chapter 3, reading there from verse 19. Colossians chapter 3, verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Uh, problems come when we allow bitterness in the family. You, you know if two people are living together, no matter how good they are, uh, once in a while, we may not fully understand one another. Think about it. When Jesus Christ was here on earth, no sin in his life, and yet there were times when the best of his disciples did not understand him. And then you will find between Peter and Jesus, he began to reveal great deep things of his life unto them. And he revealed the purpose why he came to the earth. And then Peter took hold of him and said, that will never happen to you. He misunderstood the Lord. And it is possible for the wife, a Christian wife, to misunderstand the husband. Both of them are saved. Both of them sanctified. Both of them filled with the Holy Ghost. But the, sometimes a problem arises. They cannot understand one another. And see what Jesus said. Get thee behind me, Satan. Because you do not know the things that belong to God, but the things that belong to men. Strong language. And sometimes it is possible that sometimes, you know, when we are very familiar, living as husband and wife, the husband may say something to the wife. Strong language. But you check up yourself when you get back home. That happened in Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew chapter 17, Jesus picked Peter as one of the people to go with him to the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus was not bitter against Peter. And the husband, following the life of Jesus, following the pattern of Jesus, must not be bitter against the wife. What causes all these problems in our families? contention. Things we shouldn't even quarrel about. We shouldn't even discuss too much. Uh, I say this way, oh yes, my husband will go that way. This thing doesn't relate to salvation, doesn't relate to sanctification, doesn't relate to heaven. They are physical, material things. In one year's time, you will even forget the consequence of the sin. It doesn't have eternal consequence. It's a mundane sin. If we finish it uh, once and for all, there should be no contention. And sometimes, and sometimes the husband should give in to the wife. You are a submissive wife. Everything has been going on fine. Even though it's only this time you don't agree, okay? I'm going to even concede everything to you because uh, I want to make you happy. And we forget about it and move on. No quarreling, no cruelty to one another. And whatever happened yesterday, that was yesterday. Yesterday is gone. Let the argument of yesterday pass. Forgive one another and forget the injury. You make yourself miserable. When you are holding on to that thing of yesterday that happened between you and your wife, you and your husband, because of that you will not eat. My brother, you are punishing yourself. Uh, that food was bought with your money. And everything there was your money. And then the wife cooked now. You say, no, I don't want to eat. What's the matter with you? It's your money. You are punishing yourself. You will have ulcer. Already if you felt that your wife offended you yesterday, you are adding ulcer to the offense. Let's be reasonable and shake that thing up and even eat more than you ate before. And sometimes there's a subtle retaliation. And you know, we destroy ourselves because of all these things. Uh, maybe the, the wife uh, with the husband, there was something that they didn't agree with. 
And because of that problem, the man is now staying somewhere and says, I don't want to see her face. I don't want to do anything and all that. And then as you are running away from the wife, because you are retaliating for what happened, you are feeling some need in your body. No, I'm going to control myself. I will not allow myself to go to her because of what happened yesterday. You go to the office and the temptations you are not having before with women, you begin to have the temptation because the wife at home, you are trying to retaliate and the retaliation you are practicing is destroying you wanting to take salvation away from you. You are angry, you pray, you cannot pray. You read the Bible, you are reading one line two times, three times, and you stay there. You say, I will read it, I will read it. The Spirit of God is not there. Concentration is not there. Why don't you close the Bible and say, this thing is destroying me. This retaliation is actually undoing me. Go to your wife and settle. Sometimes uh, the negative influence and control of the in-laws that come to the family to destabilize the family. Sometimes it's selfishness. We are inconsiderate of the partner. Sometimes there is too much secrecy, holding on things to yourself. And of course, love of money is the root of all evil. And if there is mismanagement of money, spending without considering the needs of others in the family, there will be a problem. And you know some of us, we have a training in the background. is that your want is by order. Do this, obey first, then complain. And in your place of work, that's how you give order. And everybody will line up. And then you get married. Then you tell your wife, here is what you do. And your wife smiles and said, am I a slave? See the way you are talking to me. Uh, you don't understand? I am the head. This is what you do. If you run your family like that, that family will hit the rock. As we have looked at all these problems today, I want you to now look back home. Look at your family. Look at yourself. Look at your husband and look at your wife. Have we offended one another? Have we injured one another? Have we stepped on one another? Have we cheated one another? There is no family present here. You've married for some time that cannot look back and say, Oh yes, we offended one another. Oh yes, that was not right. Oh yes, that didn't, uh, that didn't go well with me or with her. What are we to do to all those problems? Are we to cover them up and move on? No, you don't cover them up. You dig them out. You expose them. You tell your wife. She tells the husband. And then you discuss everything. You resolve everything. You forgive one another. In uh, Matthew chapter 18. Reading from verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother, how oft shall my husband, how oft shall my wife sin against me, and I forgive him, and I forgive her till seven times? Peter even tried. Seven times? I read of a young couple that just got married together. And then they were riding a horse. So as they were going, the uh, horse tumbled over something. The man said, one. And the wife was wondering what that meant. And, and then he stumbled again after some distance. The man said, two. And then the third time stumbled again. The man got down and brought the wife down and said, three. And killed the horse. The wife said, why did you do that? The man said, one. That means, you, you see what I did to that horse? You've got one now, one point. I'm waiting for three before I kick you away. <laughs> Some of you are saying, ah, isn't that what you do at home? One, two, three. We can't discuss, we can't talk again. Peter said till seven times. And Jesus says unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. I know we have not finished the outline. My purpose is not to finish the outline. My purpose is that the Spirit of God and the love of Christ will come into our families. We'll have a new family. Forgive one another. Let's start all over again. Let's now start as if we never offended one another before. Let there be love in our families. Let's rise up and pray. The Lord can do it for you. The Lord can do it for me. That all the quarreling of the past, all the contention of the past, all the argument of the past, contention with one another. We can overlook everything. Forgive one another. Seventy times seven times. And the way we spend money, the way we relate together. Let's love one another. Let's love one another. Husband and wife, love yourselves. 
do something good in the life of your wife. Your wife do something good in the life of your husband. And my brother, don't always be referring to the offense of yesterday, of last week, of last month, of last year. Love one another as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And forgive seventy times seven times. I'm 